Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Representative Jerry A. Stern, who has represented the 80th District in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which has included parts of Bedford and Blair Counties from 1993 through 2014. Representative Stern, thank you for sitting and chatting with us today. Thank you for having me today. I'd briefly like you to start off and talk about uh, your early life and the influences that led you to a career in public service. I believe where it started, I'm, I used to work in a grocery store, packed groceries, produce manager. I started out as produce manager, worked my way up to assistant manager, then to manager of the grocery store. It was an IGA store. And um, actually, I worked for my future father-in-law, I didn't know it at the time. But um, ended, I worked there for about eight years. And there was an opportunity in a Blair County courthouse that came open. And probably um, what got me interested in that, my mother worked for the sheriff's office in Blair County for 20 years. And she, all, she was chief deputy sheriff whenever she retired. But I had an interest in the courthouse because um, whenever I was younger, 11, 12, 13 years old, she would take me to the courthouse with her in the summer months when we were off school. I'd sit in on the trials, I'd sit in the courtrooms, listen to the judges. And uh, I took all that in. So I got an early experience uh, being around law enforcement, the judges, attorneys, um, sheriff's office. And uh, it was quite made an impact on me more so than what I realized. <clears throat> and then whenever I was in a grocery store, my mother came home one day and said, the uh, prothonotary said that his first deputy is retiring. Um, would you be interested in in interviewing for that position? And um, I was like, Mom, I, I know you worked, she worked for a while in a prothonotary's office before she worked in the sheriff's office. And was like, I know you work there, but I don't know what they do. And she said, well, you'll learn. Uh, if, if you're interested, you can learn, and, and I know that you can do this. So I went in and interviewed with the prothonotary, Vernon Weiss, and he hired me on a spot. The only thing he was concerned about was he was such an honorable, honest man, and he was concerned about there were two, th that would make two Stearns working in the courthouse. Since his mother, my mother had already previously worked for him, uh, and he took her recommendation. He wanted to make sure uh, it was okay to hire this other Stern, her son. <laughs> and so he went to one of the commissioners, who well-respected uh, president commissioner, been in office for many, many years, Bill Stauffer. And Bill said, of course you, could, you can hire him. He's a, you know, I go to church with him. And he was talking about different things. And, and Bill did stop at our church occasionally uh, on, on his way to Racetown, uh, I remember he, campaign years he was always in stopping by but he was like a almost like a second member of our church so he recommended me and said there's nothing wrong with that Vernon and Vernon took the commissioner's um, uh, influence and then decided to, to hire me so I started in the courthouse and I left my grocery store days and then that began my my career in public service and I worked eight and a half about eight years in the prothonotary's office as deputy first deputy prothonotary and clerk of court. Mm -hmm. Then Mr. Weiss ended up deciding to retire a little bit early. He had been in a prothonotary's office for probably close to 40 years as deputy and then as prothonotary. And he decided it was time for him to, uh, to retire and he wanted to do some other things. So um, he's, he resigned a little early. I was running for prothonotary at the same time because he knew he, he was going to finish that term. So there was no one running in a primary, no one running in the general. I had a free ride to that elected position. And um, I was, first of all, I was um, nominated um, to serve as acting prothonotary. And uh, I'll never forget Bob Jubilee told me that um, he was president pro tem of the Senate at the time. Of course, he was my senator from Blair County. Right. I remember Senator Jubilee came up to me, called me one time, he said, if you think I'm trading a, a judgeship for your prothonotary position, you're crazy. I'm not. So, uh, and it was kind of interesting because back then, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the Senate would, I, I'll give you, you know, sure. your judge nomination, and that's how they would concur with vacancies. Mm -hmm. And um, Senator Jubilee said, I'm not trading you because you're running unopposed. You're going to be reelected. You're going to be elected no matter what. Right. You can serve as acting prothonotary. 
but Governor Casey then did name me acting prothonotary, and there was no trade, no, no agreements that had to be worked out politically. So that was kind of a thing that no one ever knew about, but Senator Jubilee said, I'm not trading you. <laughs> And so uh, I ended up uh, becoming prothonotary and clerk of court. And at the same time then, I had worked in the previous um, uh, representative's campaign. Mr. Johnson, who was my predecessor, served for 14 years in the General Assembly from 1978 to 1992. And 14 years he served. And I was his campaign chairman for six of those 14 years. And I volunteered for him during that whole period of time, helping him get reelected. What influences then shaped you to become a Republican? I have always had Republican leanings, and I think one time when my mother worked in the sheriff's office, she worked for a Democrat sheriff, and she made me switch parties to Democrat, I remember, mm -hmm. just so we could vote for her boss <laughs> in the pri in primary. The primary. Yeah. And so then I remember after he won, I ended up switching back to Republican, and I've been a Republican ever since. And, um, and it's, it's really, when I first ran uh, 20 years, 22 years ago, I ran on what many members are running on today, a limited scope of government. I just felt the government was too intrusive, too big, and um, I wanted less government. Um, actually, my campaign motto 22 years ago was less government, better government. And it holds true today. Nothing has changed from 22 years ago to this moment. But that was kind of my philosophy, and I came, I came from a farm, grew up on a farm to begin with. So I'm an old farm boy that went to a grocery store, ended up going to the courthouse, ended up in the state house. Could you describe your, your educational background? I know it's a big, uh, a big topic for you. I know you're very active uh, with students and things over the course of your career, but your educational background. My educational background, and, and I, I find my um, interns that I deal with all the time just are totally shocked by this, but I don't have a college degree, and I do have college credits. Um, I graduated from high school, and at the time, I, I've always been working. I've been working my entire adult life, so I've been out dealing with the public, whether it's in the, in the private sector, packing groceries, dealing with customers for, for many, many years, or the public sector, dealing with um, people coming into the courthouse that had their needs, um, filing court documents, civil, criminal documents, keeping all those things in order. And so um, that really never, I, I thought about going to college, took college prep in high school. And when I got, got out of high school, I just wanted to go to work. So I went, I had jobs, and I just started working. I did go back to school eventually to, and this is what began me as a lifelong learner. And I went back to college to get certain things that I wanted to be um, more versed in, well-skilled. Uh, I went back for a speech class because I wasn't good at getting up talking to people. Um, I took history classes, which I love. I took architecture. And why architecture? And it just intrigued me. It was interesting. I thought it was, it was really good. And, and um, so I took some classes that I wanted to enhance my public abilities, pu public uh, service, and uh, after that, I just, um, I, I was working at the same time, raising a small family, so, and doing other things as well as playing softball on the weekends, too, so mm -hmm. I had uh, my athletic side of me that we, we played almost professionally, the team that I played for, so between all the other things going on in my life, I really didn't have time to go to college, and that wasn't real important, but in the years since that, I have studied, read. Uh, I go through probably three books a week that I read. Uh, I'm always reading something, and I study all the time. So um, I'm continuing a life learning process, mm -hmm. and I think that um, you know our education is what we make it. And uh, so, do I miss not going to college? Um, not really, because I don't have the debt that the poor students that are coming out of mm -hmm. college have now and whenever my wife and I were married raising our children we were trying to just make our mortgage payments and sure. make payments to get by we didn't make a lot of money so I know what it's like to come from humble beginnings and origin so um, I've just always worked and it's part of my it's part of my heritage part of what my parents taught me your next step then was to run for the House of Representatives there next was an op open was seat 
Well, let's talk about your, uh, uh, your motivation for running for the House. Well, I didn't want to run. <laughs> I didn't want to run for the House. Um, I, had a, I was prothonotary, Blair County, clerk of prothonotary and clerk of courts. No one even knew what that, what that position mm -hmm. did. No one ran against me. Uh, I could have been prothonotary and clerk of court for as long as I wanted to be. I could have retired there. But Mr. Johnson, when he first came to me and said, I'm not running for re-election, I want you to be the first to know. I just want you to think about it. Do you think about running for office? I said, I, I don't want to run for office. But he told me one, something that really stuck in my head and it made a lot of sense. He said, I think you could make a difference there and I think you would be a great representative if you put your mind to it, if you wanted to do that. And the more I thought about it, and my family and I, my wife and I, um, we prayed about it, you know, what, what God's will was for my life. And so um, I decided to, you know, why not? It, my family, we talked about it. My parents, my in-laws, my, my wife, my children. It was a family decision. And we jumped into the race. And uh, there were 10 people in the primary. Mm -hmm. And I was number eight on the ballot. And I'm thinking, who, who's going who's gonna to look at number eight on the ballot and um, vote for me? But I did have an advantage. I had already been elected prothonotarian clerk of court for Blair County. So the people in Blair County knew who Jerry Stern, from one election anyhow, who I was. And um, like I said, Mr. And Mr. Johnson endorsed me as well. Um, and so with his endorsement and enough people uh, decided to pick me in the primary and I survived that, and then um, ran against a, a, just a wonderful gentleman, uh, Joe Whitmer, who uh, ran against Mr. Johnson the election before that. And uh, Mr. Whitmer, to this day, I call him Mr. Whitmer because out of respect for him, but to this day, um, he considers me one of his dearest friends. And um, he just called recently, and we, we talk quite frequently. And uh, he's not even my district anymore, but. We stay in touch, and that's the respect that I had for my first Democrat opponent, and we've continued a friendship to this day. And you've only had two other races throughout your 22 years that you actually had an opponent, so you must have done something right over those years. Well, those those two years, <clears throat> those two years, um, I under, I know why I got Democrat opponents in those two years. Um, the one opponent um, at the one time um, ran at the uh, insistence of the Labor Council in Blair County because I had signed on to a right to work bill. Mm -hmm. And then I found out later that Governor uh, Ridge, who was governor at the time, was never going to sign a right to work bill. So I got an opponent out of that and this young man ran. And of course I had to raise some money and go through a campaign and, you know, you know, run for reelection. And um, and that election was, you know, was successful and so um, I didn't have another opponent again until reapportionment which was 10 years later, and the mayor of, of Tyrone was not happy because the borough had been split in half with reapportionment. And she was in my district. Her son across the street was in the 81st district. And um, so she had one of the council members from Tyrone run against me, and, um, and I ended up being successful again and had support uh, of a lot of friends and family. And, Former Representative uh, Majority Leader Sam Hayes mm -hmm. had represented that district before. Mm -hmm. He was very supportive of me, went out campaigned for me, and we had pictures taken. And, mm -hmm. and Sam has always been a good friend from the time that he was. Uh, we never served together in the House, but I served with him as Legislative Affairs Director for Governor, Corb Governor Ridge and also as the Ag Secretary under Governor Ridge as well. So coming from an ag community, we had a bond and um, a friendship that, uh, and, and t to this day, he's still one of my mentors. Uh, I go to Sam Hayes for advice and just um, for um, wisdom. He shares so much wisdom because he was here 22 years as well. It's said that representatives, because they're on a two-year term, are constantly running for office. Do you feel that's true? And what, things, and what things have you done over the course of 22 years to maintain that success that you've had? Um, it, it's interesting. All the, um, 
my, my, my wife is to the point where <clears throat> she doesn't want to go to another chicken dinner at a fire hall <laughs> yeah. um, or at, uh, or it used to be at the Sheraton, Ramada, what, whatever, wherever all the groups or the associations have their dinners and their meals and their annual things, at fundraisers and things like that. So my wife would not care if we ever went to another one of those type of meals, um, but, but I would go to those. And after a period of time, I, she has her own career. She's an, a registered nurse. She's a nurse practitioner. And now she's a teacher, and an instructor of her um, the alternate career and vocational um, ed institution, and uh, also for St. Francis College. So um, she has her own career, and we're raising two grandchildren right now. So, but I always told my wife, I said, "Honey, don't worry about it. I'll go to this function." So I went to a lot of functions by myself um, later on. But, but to, in the beginning, she went with me all the time because she thought that was she needed to do that to support me. So um, after, after a while, um, she said, if you don't mind, I'd say, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll go on my own. So it, it's really the, all the, the uh, they call them the chicken, chicken dinners, the chicken circuit or whatever. Mm -hmm. I love chicken, but, you know. It gets a, it gets a lot. There's a limitations a even at times. <laughs> Talk a little bit more about your district in a little bit more detail, the, the demographics, the geography, uh, the industry. Uh, that's part of Blair and, uh, and Bedford County? Well, Bedford County, originally, ten, my first 10 years, I represented Bedford County. Um, I, I represented the northwestern portion of Bedford County, clear up to Pleasantville, little borough um, on Route 56, leads over to uh, the mountain, over to, to Winburn, over to Johnstown. And um, a lot of people, it's like, where's Pleasantville? You know, and there were communities there by the name of Lovely and right. Frigid. And of course, I represent Blue Knob, and there's re mm -hmm. these really neat names for communities. Um, there's a Pavia Township, and West St. Clair, and King, and Kimmel, and, and it was just an interesting geographic, rural, uh, farming, a uh, few industries, not many, uh, in the Bedford County portion. But they were very dependent upon um, me visiting them. I never had an office in Bedford County. But I did set up a um, uh, one of the township buildings in King Township. Uh, the supervisor said I could use their municipal building. I went in and I would have um, once a week I would be there for anyone who wanted to come visit me, see me. But then eventually, and we always had a phone number with the local area code that mm -hmm. they they would call a local number and it would direct to Hollidaysburg. So we could, we would pick up the phone and talk to them personally, like just like you know I've talking to you now and so they they would be calling a home, home number they want to know where my office is and I would basically say well you just called the township building and we rerouted you to Hollidaysburg but uh, if you need to see me and I went over there and visited and, sure. and had town meetings and things like that so it was uh, it's a big geographic area and then at that time I represented um, a portion of uh, Logan Township Allegheny Township just about everything except the city of Altoona uh, and then part of, um, uh, no, all, all of Northern Blair at that time was 81st District. Um, so I represented Cove, Hollidaysburg, Claysburg, uh, the southern portion of um, Blair County. And then this western portion of Bedford County, which I had to go over a mountain and travel a good ways to get to the far end of that. Sure. So it um, separated by a couple mountains. So, but. Uh, we got there and made friends with the supervisors, the local officials, the school districts, and the people. And then when uh, reapportionment came 10 years later, I didn't want to give them up because we were friends and I was, I was helping them. Uh, I'll never forget one of the township boards was all Democrat and uh, <clears throat> it was Kimmel Township. And they were registered about three to one Democrat. And um, one of the township uh, Democratic committee people, um, and he became he became a friend as well. He said, "I campaigned against you, Jerry. It's when I did have one of those one three apportionment. I had a an opponent. He said, "I campaigned against you, Jerry, and you still carried my precinct three to one. I want to know how you did that." Well, um, I had the three township supervisors who were all Democrat working for me at the polls too. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
we, we were <laughs> we were very supportive of one another and we helped one another and I cared about them I truly honestly cared about their needs and they were just a little township and all the all the townships in Bedford County were uh, they felt like they were being ignored and I know that feeling from where I live in Martinsburg which is Southern Cove we always felt that we were being ignored by um, by the city of Altoona uh, elected officials too so we're out there they only come out here when they want reelected and you know we don't see them any other time so I made a point of getting there meeting the people getting to know them finding out what their needs were trying to address those needs and that was it was just constituent service it was serving the needs of of um, the municipalities that's all that's all I did I tried to represent them to the best of my ability what types of specific things did constituents often come to you for uh, and, either and here in Harrisburg or in the district uh, about anything under the sun usually we're the the office of last resort um, it's either us or the president you know I've heard that too uh, if you're not going to help me then I'm going to call the president and I always tell them please feel free to do so go ahead and call the president uh, I don't think he's going to be very helpful as well uh, a lot of, it, it's just anything it's anything from a registration thing a form or government bureaucracy a permit trying to get something done where you you're so frustrated and and maybe it's a maybe it's a bill maybe it's something medical could be health related could be uh, something you're having a problem with the insurance company it could be um, just about anything you can think of under the, under the sun it deals with state agencies agriculture revenue could be a revenue issue could be back taxes and something that they build you for that you feel feel you don't know um, we've worked with with uh, people on all kinds of things but um, a lot of things just driver's license registration things and and um, they 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 always thought my constituents always thought that I uh, traveled to Harrisburg every way every day just to take their driver's license back and forth <laughs> Because I was in the office one day, and he said, "Have you gone to Harrisburg yet today to take these licenses down?" And and little did he know that I was in the district at the time we weren't in session, but uh, we would mail them down sure. to Harrisburg to have them processed. But <laughs> we we probably were in the top five in our caucus. Uh, I think right now I'm number two in our caucus as far as dealing with these per pieces for per individuals. And when people see me at the grocery store. Or a church or something, they'll they'll remind me. Thank you for that that driver's license or that registration form that you got for me. And and th those are the things that people remember. It's it's what you've done for them. So uh, we just tried to make make it a, as easy as we could. Cut through as much red tape, bureaucracy. Um, if, if sometimes I believe state government would do what they should be doing, uh, we wouldn't need as us as quite as much. But um, sometimes the bureaucracy gets a little bit too large. We're the only resource left that can cut through that. So, very firmly believing in uh, representative government. How about some of the special projects that you've taken back to your district to, to make it um, more uh, fruitful, to improve the area that you're from? When I first ran, um, people there again, <clears throat> why are you running for office? What do you want to do? Well, I want to improve jobs. I want a qu better quality of life for the 80th district, for Blair County, for Bedford County. But I wanted to improve um, our way of living. One of the first things that I recall working, again, I was very fortunate that I was working not only with um, my other elected officials that, that I worked with, were Congressman Bud Schuster, Senator Bob Jubilee, who was president pro tem, Congressman Schuster who was the uh, chairman of the of the Federal Transportation Committee, and um, Rick Geist was chairman of the House Transportation Committee, and um, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by some people that had been in office with experience. Dick Hess was in Bedford County; uh, he's another former prothonotary. So we we worked well together, you know, as a team. We didn't always agree, we didn't always agree, but we worked together. For our constituents in our district. Some things I remember is working with Senator Jubilee and getting something as simple as a Penvest grant approved for Greenfield Township. One of the earliest things that I ever did. It was for $6.4 million. I was going back uh, for, uh, through the ar my archives the other day looking at newspaper articles and there was a big town meeting and the residents didn't want to pay any more sewage bills and there were a couple spokespeople and 
prominent members of the community speaking out against it. And fortunately, the uh, Claysburg uh, Kimmel uh, Municipal Authority went through and, and supported it. And uh, because they were on a they were on a a um, DEP order that they could not expand their sewage, they were on a no tap where they couldn't they couldn't issue permits anymore. If you wanted to build a house in Greenfield Township, you couldn't do it because hmm. you couldn't tap onto their sewage system. There was a no tap provision, no industry, no no building, and basically they were to, they, they were to stand still unless they expanded. Remember that grant um, allowed them to expand to where they needed to be. They have since expanded since that time. But that opened the doors for Sheets Corporation to eventually move their distribution center, and, and they were in competition with West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia. Other states were competing to take Sheets mm -hmm. to these other states because they were offering, offering them everything, working with Senator Jubilee, Congressman Schuster, road improvements were made, infrastructure was put in place, sewage was there, an industrial park was created wow. just for Sheets, and now they have their Sheets Brothers Bakery there, they have their trucking system there, partial, and another part of it's built in Blair County for all their trucks that mm -hmm. they send out on the road. And uh, there's probably about 800 to 1,000 people employed in that industrial park, mm -hmm. my son included. So when I ran, I wanted a better quality of life for my children and for those living in Blair County. My son's a living product mm -hmm. of that opportunity. He started at a sheet store um, behind the counter, you know, welcome to sheets. Back then, they used to have to turn your pump on. They're automated now. Uh, yeah. But at one time, you'd go to sheets, and they would say, welcome to sheets, um, pump five's on. <laughs> my son did that. And he's worked for them for 14 years now and worked his way up the ladder. Um, worked in the freezer cooler at the distribution center because mm -hmm. it paid a dollar an hour or more. Did that for five years and, and became the manager of the freezer cooler. Got out of there as soon as he could and now he's a supervisor of the Sheets Brothers Bakery and wow. he supervises about 45 employees. And this is an opportunity for him. Now he's getting married mm -hmm. and, um, and he's going to be living in Blair County. Uh, actually building a house on our family farm. So. And he and his uh, fiance is mm -hmm. going to be married next month. That's tremendous. That's great. Um, I want to transition to your house service. Uh, how did you feel uh, on your first swearing in day? How often were you to Harrisburg before that day? What type of feelings did you have? <clears throat> I'd been to Harrisburg before, and I, I just knew it was a big place. And I remember one time when I went down with Mr. Johnson, he told me to go someplace to get something. and. And so I went, and somehow I got around some of those spiral steps and up to a floor that I don't even know if it's numbered. I think it's called six, but it connects all kinds of things around the dome and mm -hmm. upstairs there, and you don't know which side of the capital right. you're on. And you feel like a rat in a maze, and I got lost up there, and, and so I didn't like it. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, it was intimidating because it was such a big place, so many people, sure. and it was, it was like, like a city, walking in a city and you don't know anyone. And um, at first, when I first was sworn in, uh, my family was all with me and it's, it's amazing how we change from that first swearing in. And we have these beautiful intentions of coming down here and just making such a big difference, changing the world, changing Harrisburg, turning the dome if we can upside down and transforming state government. And I found that it's a slow process. It's a day-by-day -day process. And I found out that the more you can change Harrisburg is by influencing people and also teaching others and, and also setting an example. And if there's a legacy that I leave at Harrisburg, it's maybe the example that I set and the life that I lived. And I'm still one of those people, my word is my bond. And there's some really neat stories about some of the things that how bills became law that were just done just based upon an agreement. And mm -hmm. it was uh, a little bit of horse trading, I guess you would call it. But it, um, it it's really comes down to people trusting one another. And uh, if they don't trust one another, they're not going to work together. 
and um, I probably have uh, I have as many friends on the Democrat side as I do the Republican side. I mean, I try to get along with everyone that I work with. So, because um, I always find out there's one of those guys come back and now they're the next chief of staff or somebody. Right. Sure. You know. So you want to be friends with them, especially if you have a bill in their committee. <laughs> so, You mentioned Sam Hayes as one of your early mentors, uh, but you never, like you said, served with them in the House. Who were some of the members in the House that you served at, that you went to for, for guidance and for knowledge? Um, fortunately, I always sat on the House floor next to a leader, one of the leaders. So, um, you know, it could have been Howard Fargo um, sitting next to him. I sat next to uh, John Barley for mm -hmm. four years. John Barley was appropriations chairman. Um, he was a farmer from Lancaster County, so we, we, we related on that. I served on the appropriations committee with him. Probably one of the main influencers with me uh, who really took me under his wing somewhat and, and kind of, uh, you know, taught me how to be a representative was Joe Pitts. Congressman Pitts, and he was a gentleman, and another gentleman who's retiring this year, Paul Clymer. So whenever I tell people, like, who do you look up to? Who are those members that you look up to that you respect because of their their values, because they're consistent in their message and what they what they're all about, what they want to do? Um, Congressman Pitts is one that I comes to mind. Paul Clymer is another. There's some outstanding members in the House right now that uh, that I'm friends with, that uh, you know, that we break bread with, we uh, pray together, we you know, we work with on issues. And uh, Matt Baker's one of those ones that come to mind, and um, as well as Gene DiGirolamo, and Gene's a good friend of mine as well. And you know, we differ on the issues. Sure. It's not we were. He'll, Gene will be like this way, and well, he's pro gambling. I'm anti gambling, but. But we're friends, and we can agree to disagree on issues. And at the end of the day, uh, he'll support me on issues that are difficult, even in his district, like pro-life issues and mm -hmm. things like that. So um, it, it's just that kind of relationship you have with other members. And I always went to other other leaders to seek advice or watch what they were doing. I know uh, got a lot of advice from um, Representative Geis when he served in the House. Mm -hmm. Representative Hess. Uh, uh, Senator Jubilee, Congressman Schuster, mm -hmm. and because uh, they had been around for a while, so I just watched them, took tidbits of you know what they shared, and I kept my ears open a lot, kept my mouth shut more than I talked, mm -hmm. and um, that was I think one of the biggest things. The first few years down here, mm -hmm. I just sucked everything in like a sponge, and I was relatively young at the time. I was 30, about 36, I believe, when I first ran somewhere in that ballpark. Um, or 37, but I, I just wanted to learn. So I, people ask me, what did you, uh, you know, what, what did you do the first few years? And I said, I just listened to everyone. I said, I just took it all in and I did introduce some bills and, you know, I thought needed to be introduced, but not a lot of them went real far. Um, but we can talk about the legislation later and really the first bill then, it kind of transformed and I, and I watched it transform the economy in Pennsylvania. And that's a bill that I can talk about later. But it was a bill that um, the move the gas, uh, the, the, shut off, the shut off switches. Yeah. Um, the first bill I, that really was signed into law for me uh, was a bill um, that the convenience stores wanted so they could expand their stores into the super stores because there was a 100 foot shut off from the inside the store to the furthest pump away. So there was only 100, and you know that wasn't that wasn't big enough for them to. They wanted to expand their pumps. They wanted to expand the the parking areas, you know, for the convenience stores. That bill um, allowed Sheets and others, other convenience stores, to expand. And remember the battle that we went through with, um, you know, I'll call it single gas stations or mom and pop gas stations, and I and I really struggled with that because. That was, I, I used to work in a mom and pop gas station. I pumped uh, gross, er, gasoline for many years when I was in high school. So I, I was connected to them in one way, but they were a thing of the past. They weren't a thing of the future. So I struggled with this whole legislation. But I had, they had lobbyists up here, and, 
and sure. well-connected lobbyists, and so I had to go around and try to figure out how to, uh, to move forward. But eventually we got this bill passed. Since that time, convenience stores, turnpikes, that has changed in another time or so. Now we have the expansion that we have on turnpike facilities, mm -hmm. um, convenience stores, and allowed them to, to enter into a modern era of, of economics for them to be the convenience store that they want to be. So it was that original bill, was my first bill, that started that whole threshold, um, allowing them to take off. That was one of the first bills that, uh, that I remember. What are some of the other legislative achievements uh, that you've had over the course of your career? Uh, there's been quite a, quite a good many. Um, one thing, just recently, um, it'd probably be easier to go recently and work my way back, but um, about two years ago, there was um, three years ago, um, some police off one police officer came to me, a township officer, uh, Terry Dellinger, and said to me, he said, um, I just had two guys in my backseat of my cruiser. They were supposedly friends, and they were like stabbing each other and beating each other up, up in the back over because they were high on bath salts. And I'm thinking, you know, something you put in your bath at home, you know, those little bubble things or whatever. I'm like, really? And then when we did more research, we mm -hmm. found bath salts were manufactured. They were ingredients that were synthetic in nature, mm -hmm. similar to you get a high, similar to cocaine or something like that. And, uh, and it, they were purchased in these little containers, and they were legal. You could go into, like, you know, a cigarette place or a pawn place, pawn shop, buy these things. They were under the counter usually, but you could buy them for, like, 40 bucks a jar and uh, take them home. And, these guys were, they, they were shooting them, injecting them. There were different ways to take it. But it basically, it's a hallucinogenic, um, hallucinogenic, and it makes you just uh, go into a, another world. Um, several people have died from because uh, they, were, they were doing this in the woods. Like two, I remember two people died of bath salts because they were, uh, they exposed themselves in the Allegheny National Forest and they died of hyp hyp hyperthermia because they didn't, they thought, and another person thought electricity was getting him, and it was just mm -hmm. um, very bad, but it was legal. And so the first bill was introduced. We got it passed into two other bills that uh, outlaw synthetic marijuana, synthetic, um, another synthetic uh, drug, and was signed into law. But then they became, uh, the manufacturers became sophisticated redesigned it, and then they, uh, they ended up introducing it again and uh, with a different synthetic nature. So this time we had a state police lab and the Pittsburgh uh, police lab and the Philadelphia police lab come up with a uh, formulary that didn't matter how they changed it, mm -hmm. they were still doing the underlying purpose of the original legislation. So we, we rewrote the law to make it extremely difficult for the manufacturers to get around the law. So it's one of the strongest um, bath salt pieces of legislation in the country. We just passed that in 2012. Okay. Governor Corbett signed it once again. So the original was signed in 11, and the second one was signed in 2012. Going back, putting on my farm hat on, back to the old farm days, um, I've always been active in Farm Bureau, and I've always supported uh, agriculture. It's really the number one industry in, in Blair County, um, Bedford County. Number two industry, of course, is tourism. So now I'm tourism chairman. Mm -hmm. So it all worked well, suited me to, to be a proponent of both of those issues, uh, those industries. The REAP legislation, <clears throat> uh, at one time, um, Township supervisors would make ordinances in their township. And basically, a lot of them were in a southern tier, uh, Fulton County, uh, Adams County, some of the counties that the border Maryland um, line, the Mason-Dixon line. And um, some of the individuals would move here from Maryland, Baltimore, wherever. Well, they wanted the life that they had in Baltimore or wherever they came from. So they were more environmentally conscious as far as odors and things like that, not familiar with the country smell mm -hmm. of agriculture. So they tried to 
passed these ordinances where they were over restrictive and not allow agriculture to expand. And um, then these ordinances would prohibit the farmer from maybe expanding his cattle operation or dairy operation or his beef operation or his hog or swine or his um, uh, poultry operation. And so um, they were constantly trying to go back to the ordinance and you can't do this because we have a Right to Farm Act in Pennsylvania. So that um, was during the Rendell era and um, they came up with, at the time it was Secretary Wolf, and um, he came up with a thing that uh, that uh, was described as REAP and it's, um, I'm sorry, it was described as ACRE. I'm getting ahead of myself here, it was ACRE. And um, it was the Agricultural Communities and, Rec and um, Rural Environment mm -hmm. is what ACRE stood for. They basically, because it was a conflict between rural and urban coming together. And so uh, we changed that law and the Republicans at the time were in a minority in the House. And so I was on the Ag Committee at the time. And so Sheila Miller and Steve Maitland from Adams County, myself, we offered amendments that changed the whole acre proposal. That, um, Governor Rendell had set up two boards. We eliminated both of those boards. 65 um, ag organizations, environmental organizations, I mean every organization you could think of was supportive of the governor's proposal and the secretary's proposal, Secretary of Ag. And the three of us on the Ag Committee talked to the chairman, Chairman Hershey, um, and then he was another gentleman that I looked up to and always respected uh, because he was just very honest and direct, another old farmer. Mm -hmm. And um, so we ended up offering amendments that the administration, the governor opposed. And I'll never forget it, the governor's chief of staff came to the Ag Committee meeting that day when we offered the amendments and wanted the Democrat members to vote no against our amendments and we got three Democrats to vote with us and and um, the rest, all the Republicans voted together so we passed it out of committee, passed on the floor and it became law and now it's the model of how you work together rural farming areas coming together. It's a model for the nation. Farm Bureau, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and the Department of Ag too Pennsylvania Department of Ag, they use it as a model now, and they go out and talk about our acre bill, uh, mm -hmm. but it looked completely different than what it was proposed as. We just felt it was too bureaucratic. The main thing that, that we brought into that was the oversight of the Attorney General. You know, the Attorney General is a top law enforcement <coughs> officer, could determine whether the ordinance was legal or illegal. So. If it was illegal, he told them that they could not, it was in violation, and they would have to change it. Otherwise, uh, there was an appeal process through the Commonwealth Court, mm -hmm. and it made it uh, easier for, for just an average farmer, an average person. They don't have lawyers. They don't have people to, right. to be able to defend themselves. They're independent business people just struggling to get by. And so um, that made it easy for our farming community, and eventually it became a model for the country and I always sat back after it was all said and done and I got in trouble for doing what we did but afterwards everyone agreed that it was it was a good bill and right thing to do so um, that was one of the things that behind the scenes you know there was a lot of um, discussions and I got um, beat up pretty good on that one sometimes by some of the groups one thing I'll never forget though my local farm bureau in Blair County said and they were getting pressure from the from the state farm bureau because the state farm bureau was with the governor, the governor sure. and, and the secretary of ag which they should have been but my local farm bureau said jerry whatever you think is right we're with you we're going to stand behind you and um, we're getting a lot of pressure you know, to, to work you over but you do what you think is right and they allowed me to do that my local farm bureau um, forever indebted for them there again it was a couple of wise old farmers who were on the board there said Jerry we trust you we know you know what you're doing and uh, we're with you all the way one of the farmers was from Bedford County one was from Blair County and they stood behind me and if I had the local people behind me hey I was willing to take on the governor and whoever else mm -hmm. so <clears throat>
Another one you brought up was the, the Resource Enhancement and Protection Act, REAP. It was another bill that uh, was passed during the Rendell administration. And there again, Republicans in the House were in the minority, and I just thought this was a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. At the time, there had been discussion about uh, Ed Rendell being interested in, in maybe being president or going to D.C., and I thought, you know, uh, Governor, what a better way to, to do this than to maybe support this Resource Enhancement and Protection Act, which basically applied um, best management practice, practices mm -hmm. on the farm. And, um, and I thought it was a win-win because we were cleaning up the Susquehanna River Basin, right. we were cleaning up streams, we were cleaning up the environment, fresh, fresh water, we were removing nitrates, phosphates, everything is bad for the Chesapeake Bay. So I had a coalition together, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Association, Pennsylvania Builders Association, and the Farm Bureau. And those four groups supported um, the acre legislation and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the REAP legislation. Too many acronyms here today. It's the REAP legislation. Sure. And, um, and I ended up um, offering it uh, then as we debated a bill in the House for film tax credits. Hmm. And the governor wanted film tax credits. And he wanted, uh, he wanted a $50 million proposal. And at the time, I'll never forget, um, the um, Ag Committee Chairman was Mike Hanna. And Mike Hanna currently is the current Democrat whip in the House. I also remember the, um, the floor leader was um, um, Representative DeWeese. And, um, and his chief of staff, the who, people that were running the floor for him on bills, came over and, and um, we were talking about this uh, film tax credit. Well, I offered two amendments to the film tax credit. One, for $25 million for this REAP proposal, for tax credits for REAP, it would be a dollar per dollar match. Of course, the farmer would have to put up 50% or the whoever's putting up the best management practice of whatever they were doing, and then 50% would come from the state, the tax credit. So it was a match. It wasn't just a giveaway. It was a match and an investment. And um, so I had a $25 million amendment, and um, two, and we were already looking at this amendment for $50 million for the film tax credits for Hollywood, first time, first time we ever did yeah. it. And um, I had friends in the Senate at the time in the Ag Committee over there. and. Uh, and also the Appropriations Committee, who, who told me, you know when you're, that bill comes over to, to the Senate, we're going to add another $25 million to it. It's going to be $75 million whenever we're finished with it. And I said, no, I didn't know that. So it's sometimes that's why it's good to have friends hmm. down here. So I knew it was going to go to 75 So, And it was, six, it was 50 at the time, the amendment we were voting on. So the Senate was going to add 25 more and make it 75 so I had these two amendments, and I uh, also had an amendment to um, reduce the film tax credit from 50 to 25. I had another amendment to eliminate it altogether. <laughs> so Democrat floor leader comes over and, and sends his staff over, and is there any way you can pull these amendments, Jerry? Because the bill's going to be voted on. My amendments were timely found, and it would have been tough for people to vote against that to vote, you know, for t film tax credits. I mean, they weren't exactly enamored with Hollywood as much as the governor was at the mm -hmm. time, first time. And uh, I would have said that, you know, you're going to do tax credits for Hollywood producers instead of our farmers and helping the environment. I mean, I had a perfect debate lined up for that. And um, so they asked me if I would pull my amendments, and I said, well, I will if you will you know, include my uh, REAP amendment. I had one for 10 million for tax credits. I had another one for 25 million for tax credits because I knew they, they were going to up it up in the Senate. And so um, I'll never forget the floor leader at the time, um, his staff person told me, they don't, they don't have any more money, that this is as much as they can go. Uh, we'll take your, the $10 million tax credit if you drop your other two amendments. So I dropped the other two amendments to reduce the, the Hollywood film tax credit and one, the other one to eliminate it. Um, I dropped both of those amendments. And uh, I'll never forget when Mike Hanna, he was chairman of the Ag Committee, came over and 
to begin with. He said, Jerry, we, we have to oppose your, um, your REAP amendment. I'm sorry. He said, I know it's good, but he said, I have, to, I have to oppose it on the floor. I said, Mike, I said, that's fine. I understand completely. Um, the governor's not for it. But after I did my amendments and the Democrat leaders, I guess, called the governor, uh, we made sure that REAP was part of the final budget mm -hmm. and it became legislation. And Mike came over to me later and he said, Jerry said, I'm for the REAP amendment now. <laughs> And I never said another. I just said, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have your support. But I never questioned him whenever he had to oppose it sure. because he had to do what he had to do. Uh -huh. um, and so it was just one of those things. It's an inside story that, you know, people just never know. But that's the respect that I have for Mike Hanna. Uh -huh. It's the respect that he has for me is that, you know, I, I know the politics of Harrisburg, and you just have to deal with, what you have to deal with, but sometimes you just, hopefully you have another card up your sleeve you can use. It's like playing poker, I guess, sometimes and having that extra ace up your sleeve. Yeah. And so that's really the, sometimes the art of lawmaking. And mm -hmm. I never compromised anything, no one did, but um, you know, I probably would have won that battle on the floor and the governor wouldn't have got what he wanted. Right. And so this way, everyone got a little something. And by the way, when it did go to the Senate, uh, the Senate did add 25 more million, and it went from 50 million the first year of the tax credit. If you research it, look it up, mm -hmm. went to 75 million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what the governor signed. I know one of the last things that you're working on um, is the PA Tourism C Commission, mm -hmm. and I know you're trying to get that through this final final term. Talk a little bit about that and where that <clears> came about. Well, I wanted to make it. Uh, I wanted to put it into effect as a statute. Okay, and I had a disagreement with this administration as they didn't want to create another uh, commission, for example. But what I wanted to do was basically take tourism out of DCED, where it's been mm -hmm. constant. I've been through five governors, five. So I watch governors come, governors go, governors come, governors go. And the tourism people come and go, and come and go, come and go. What I wanted to do was bring the private sector into this commission so that we would have a steady, sure. continual tourism message for Pennsylvania. Right now it's our number two industry. It's a $45 billion industry. employs uh, 560,000 people in Pennsylvania. And uh, why not let the private sector that has an interest in this, that profits from this, uh, why not let them be the people that drive the marketing message. What's Pennsylvania's theme? What's their logo? No one knows it, because it changes under every administration. You got a friend in PA, uh, welcome to Pennsylvania, um, you know, visit PA or whatever the slogan of the day is, you know. Uh, we used to be the Keystone State at one, one time. But we don't have a continuous marketing message like other states. I love New York, Virginia's for lovers, you know, and we think about this all the time and because um, they advertise that message all the time and then what would want to bring you to their state. We don't market, we don't do any of that in Pennsylvania and if we don't continue to do that, our tourism dollars are going to slip and they are slipping. We're seeing less visitors, less tourists, um, it's going down. and. Um, Really, the only uh, advertising right now is by the local tourism promotion agencies, Poconos, Erie, Lancaster, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. They're all doing their own thing. So we have 47, 48 different regional groups in PA advertising their areas, but Philadelphia is one entity, and they get that from the room tax. But then how about Cowdersport, Cameron County, where there's you know, and, and they can't compete to, with the same volume. So that's why it's important that Pennsylvania has a marketing message to bring people to our state and not let the other regions bring them to those regions. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do a private-public partnership mm -hmm. to make it permanent. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's no guarantee that uh, there's a private-public partnership in place now. There's no guarantee that that will continue under a new administration in the future. You have 
served on a number of committees throughout your time here. Uh, most recently as chairman of tourism. Um, talk to me a little bit about being chairman versus just being a voting member on a particular committee and then also about some of your experiences within the com committees that you've served. Um, I served on five committees when I first got here and I, I've and it's been a lot of running you know you have to run places and I remember for 10 years I served on the Environmental Resources Committee I remember Bud George was the chairman of that committee I remember one of my first committee meetings that I traveled to a to a off-site from the Capitol was up in his district at a fire hall up there had to do with electricity um, Uni, Uni, Unilec I believe was the uh, co-op and they were having trouble keeping uh, the lights on the electricity was going out and we were in a room of 500 angry people and I was sitting up front with Bud George and uh, I think I was the only Republican and to talk about your eyes opening you know real fast um, I took it all in that night but I was amazed at how Bud George had that crowd in the palm of his hand and um, talked to them and he was going to get to the he was going to get the lights turned on one way or the other and he wanted them to know that as chairman of that committee environmental resources and so um, I, I just took that all in uh, as as a committee member one of the first committee meetings but I've served on appropriations that I've served on agriculture committee and every one of the chairmen that ever served on any of those committees I just watched I studied I you know I, I copied tried to remember the good things that chairman would do and the bad things chairman would do I've served um, you know in some committees where the chairman has been less than nice to the opposite party and has have belittled the other members and the other chairman not work together and I uh, deter I was determined if I ever became chairman I was never going to do that so my chairman uh, won the Taos Tourism Committee Thaddeus Kirkland from Delaware County one of my closest friends and every bill that we introduce is um, I'm usually the prime he's second but if he was in a majority he'd be one I'd be two and uh, that's the way we w would work together uh, we work for t we work for tourism you know it's not Republican or Democrat there's no Republican and Democrat tourism district or tourist sure. in the state so we work together for an industry you know for the common good and I think that's the way Harrisburg should be and so we try to set that example of working together we've only had one differing vote uh, I think throughout the four years that I've been chairman and that was something that the Democrat caucus was all in favor of and the Republican caucus was all in favor the other way and so we moved a bill through um, and it passed by party lines all the Democrats voted no all the Republicans voted yes about every other bill that we voted on have, has been pretty much uh, unanimous because we're all on board because I try to keep the members on board it doesn't matter you know both both sides and I, I treat them with respect uh, one time I could not make a meeting I had Chairman Kirkland chair the meeting you know I could have turned it over I have turned it over to other Republicans one one or two meetings that I couldn't attend but one time uh, we were in Chairman Kirkland's district and I said I can't make it to that meeting I'm sorry I have another function would you mind chairing the committee meeting so he chaired the committee meeting in his own district and uh, you know I did that as a courtesy to him out of respect for him and so and I've turned it over to Republican members that I see as future chairman and that are going to be coming in so kind of mentoring them now to bring them into the position I'll be vacating so <clears throat> it's all part of my mentoring right hey, even before you were chairman you had the opportunity to serve in, in uh, party leadership as right. caucus secretary mm -hmm. talk to me about the differences running internally versus running it through the state how tough it can be and why you ran for that position um, 2005 I'll just mention the year I don't even have to tell you what and you'll you'll know and anyone listening to this that knows anything about state politics will know all the infamous pay raise the 2005 midnight raid actually it was two o'clock in the morning uh, without without debate without debate and that was probably one of the hardest votes that I ever went through in my life <clears throat> but back in 19 the second term I was here in 1995 
they voted for the cost of living adjustment and I had problems with that particular bill but I knew how pay raises work down here I know you know there were you know I know what it started as for legislators and every about every 10 years or so they would vote for these twelve thousand ten thousand eight thousand dollar pay raises they would just upset everybody well why why did you get a ten thousand dollar pay raise well because for the last 10 years there, you know we were just working for the same amount so I understood that you know why legislators voted for the pay raise well then they started um, they talked about putting it together a commission well we should have a commission decide this well a commission is going to only decide what whoever appoints the commission um, is going to decide anyhow you know how fair is that going to be and you know how how they, California had a commission and <clears throat> they did away with their commission because they were probably too uh, um, luxurious with uh, with raises and giving too much money away. So then the commission form didn't work because they were giving the legislators too much. So what a better way to do it than just to vote, you know, for your own? I mean, it, that's that's what county government does. You set your own salaries, although our constitution prohibits us from accepting pay raises during the term that we're in office. So I voted for the pay raise back in 1995, second term. And I told my wife, went home, I said, honey, I don't like that vote. I didn't do it to basically increase my salary. That wasn't it. I wanted to put this thing to rest once and for all. There's a COLA there and cost of living, whatever it is. And if there is one, then you get it. And if there isn't, you don't get it. And it's pretty simple. The only thing I was worried about was that the cost of living would increase so much that it would take the salary real high. And that was the only thing I was truly concerned about. Um, but that's all we had to vote on at the time. So I voted for it and uh, didn't take the pay increase, didn't take it. And many other people who voted no took it. And there was also an unvouchered expense mm -hmm. that the judges at the time said was legal you can take this unvouchered. I didn't take the unvouchered because there again, my reading of the Constitution, uh, I felt that I couldn't do that till I was reelected. So I ran for reelection the next year and everyone knew I voted for that pay raise and I ran unopposed. So that was the next election I had. So then we have the 2005 pay raise and all the leadership came to me, all the leadership came to me from both the Senate and the House. And uh, there was some pretty top heavy candid leadership at the time. And they all wanted me to vote for it because I was more of a senior member. I said no. Oh, and I was also the subcommittee chairman of the Veterans, Veterans Affairs, Affairs Committee. Yep. So um, in the Veterans Affairs subcommittee, as a subcommittee chairman, I would have seen an increase in that pay raise of 13 or 14,000. The chairman would have got 19,000 the subcommittee chairman would have got 14000 So I was threatened uh, with my subcommittee chairmanship um, by several people. And I said, take it. I don't care. Give it to someone else. It's going to vote for the pay raise because I'm not voting for the pay raise. So if you want to take it, fine. I'll go home and I'll say why you took subcommittee cha chairmanship from me. And I'll, I'll shout it from the top of the mountain back in my district. And uh, it's not going to hurt me one bit. It, and I'm not voting for it for, you know. For, I said there were widows in my district making less than that on Social Security. And I was going to vote for a pay raise for myself for 13000 And I'd already voted for the pay raise to end all pay raises. Mm -hmm. And some of the same leaders were told me that back then. Oh, don't worry, you'll never have to vote for a pay raise ever again. Well, 10 years later, they're asking for another pay raise vote. So I, I constantly reminded them again and again and again that I, of what they told me. I already voted for my pay raise to end all pay raises, so I voted no. Got me in trouble with my, a lot of people, um, a lot of my house colleagues. Many of them wouldn't talk to me for several months. And even after it was repealed, it took a while to repair some relationships. But those members that voted for it <clears throat> knew there was a wrong vote soon after they got back home, and it never died. And it hasn't died to this day and time, 2014. 
that pay raise still is like a um, wave in the ocean. It's still reverberating here in Harrisburg, and it will continue to do so. And more people will be talking about reform because <clears throat> they don't want two o'clock, you know, right. voting sessions where in the middle of the night we're passing these obscene pills. So that um, I was a no vote, and even whenever it did pass, I did the same thing. I didn't take the unvouchered expense, and um, so I didn't pay, I didn't have to pay anything back because I didn't take anything. So I stayed the high road throughout that whole pay raise thing, and and. Um, I took them at their word. Now, I mentioned the 2,000 pay. That's what involves this whole thing. Well, why did you run for leadership? Because these guys didn't tell me the truth. They told me one thing, and then they told me another thing that suited their purpose or somebody else's purpose. And so I ran for leadership and ran against our current leadership's support. They didn't support me. They supported other people in the caucus. Right. And um, you don't run against leadership. <clears throat> you just don't do that because no one ever wins. But I spent the whole summer campaigning and visiting members, new members, old members, and uh, just telling them that I have these ideas. I just think that our leadership needs to be changed. There was an opening, caucus secretary. <clears throat> um, there were many openings that year because of the pay raise. And so I decided to run for a leadership position. And so I campaigned for it in the summer while well, people were running that year for these office, some of these offices that were being vacated and many of the members knew that their polling numbers weren't good back home. So uh, I ran for an open position. I picked the caucus secretary because that was, you know, first one in leadership and, and I thought it was something that would be interesting. And so um, I ran against two, two other, there were three other House members running. Two of them were endorsed by leadership uh, the leadership endorsed both of them because they wanted either one of them <clears throat> to win over me. Uh, and I ended up winning on the first ballot. It's a secret ballot. Caucus leadership is always behind closed doors. Nobody knows until the final numbers and the slate set. But nobody ever knows the vote totals or anything like that. They don't know the, what you go through to run for leadership. So I ran against um, the endorsements of leadership. I'll never forget the night before <clears throat> I was elected caucus secretary, um, the leaders went into the Central Pennsylvania Caucus, which is the largest caucus. It's 45, six members. And they endorsed my opponent that I was running against internally. Mm -hmm. And so I called my wife and I said, honey, I said, it's you know, it's up to the good Lord. I done all that I can do. I, you know, I campaigned all summer. I went out, talked to people, told them, you know, this is who I am. I want you to know who I am. Did it the old-fashioned way, the old, the old uh, grassroots way. And um, they endorsed the other candidate. A lot of members said, no, we've already committed to Jerry. And so the members, back the leadership back then, elected me caucus secretary. That sent a big vibration through the leadership ranks because nobody ever bucked them before and nobody ever did that. Um, I do remember one other member that did that, didn't have the blessing, still won, but he was a grassroots kind of person as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I was elected caucus secretary and then the next election came along for leadership again and uh, there, there was a, another election up to top of our ticket. Um, Speaker was running against the leader, and leader running against Speaker. Well, they both had their own candidates to run against me. <laughs> so I, I ended up then uh, beating both of their candidates again and was elected a second term caucus secretary. There were openings for other leadership positions, but I stayed as caucus secretary, just, you know, um, wanted to work with the team. And, um, and then it got to the point that, that uh, I just felt that we weren't um, being led properly, and so I ran for Speaker of the House. And um, I went, uh, and that was an internal battle as well. And, and there again, uh, um, I ran against um, a lot of friends, a lot of you know friends who were in leadership positions. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't have the support of any one of the leaders at the time. So they all <clears throat> ended up uh, getting you know their 
friends to to vote with them and, and I did still I did quite well but I didn't have 51 percent right <laughs> and so um, uh, then I was then I became chairman of the tourism committee after that mm -hmm. so it was fine and I was fine with the election and I, I tried I tried to make a difference internally and um, something that no one I don't think anyone ever knew about because you don't advertise that you're running for these positions right, so. There might have been one article in one paper that I noticed, but there again, our leadership team did a very good job of repressing the fact that one of the members of leadership was running against leadership. Mm -hmm. So that, and I never, and I didn't put anything out. I didn't advertise. I didn't put any press releases. Mm -hmm. I just did my the internal thing. And mm -hmm. now that um, now that um, I'm leaving the house, I think it's important that the public know some of that process of how you do things. I could have put out press releases and plastered my name out there all over the place had I wanted to, you know, but I didn't do that and I didn't think it was the right thing to do. And I possibly could have um, still been elected speaker on swearing in day because I had a lot of Democrat friends, but I had already said that if I didn't win the first battle that I wasn't going to go in by another means. and. So I honored that, what I had said to, to a member, well, you're not gonna do something that a former Republican member did and, right. and uh, become speaker, you know, just with the help of um, yeah. some of those on the other side. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure that I, could, I would have had a lot of support mm -hmm. on the other side, but I chose not to do that. And, uh, and I could have done that with my Republican supporters as well, but I wanted to uh, do what was best for the Republican caucus. And so um, after the internal battle was over, I took my lumps and became um, tourism chairman. And I just made the best of that that I could make it and uh, tried to take it to a brand new level, which I've, which I've tried to do. So uh, I took that as just a learning experience. It's part of life. You don't win at everything, but you learn sometimes from mm -hmm. uh, when you, you never lose, you just learn. So uh, I didn't lose anything. I just learned, learned some things along the way. It's another one of those things that life teaches you. Well, over those 20 plus years of service, um, working in a majority and a minority over those years, well, ha have you seen this move toward a more partisan type of politicking? And if so, why is that? I just think that talk shows, um, you have the left, you have the right, you know, barraging you 24 hours a day on any TV station back home. You have all these bloggers out there that are independent experts. Every one of them think they know what's best and how to govern. Most of them don't even know their history. That's why it's important that we understand our founding era, where we, where we came from. Um, and I think, you know, I told you I took architecture classes whenever I attended Penn State Altoona. Well, now I give capital tours, and we start, you know, in the governor's reception room. We go to the House floor, Senate chamber, and we go to the Supreme Court chamber. But I can give um, a history, uh, a heritage tour. Uh, I can give a religious tour. I can give anything that combination of all that. Combine that with all the amenities that we have as far as architecture, uh, stained glass windows, marble sculpting, this, the, uh, the um, tile floor from Bucks County, the Mercer tile, and uh, tell you stories about everything here. And some of that could be from what I studied in college, but more so for the love of this building and the studying that I've studied this building for 22 years. So, and I've read the books in the Capital Preservation Committee, anything that they've put out, the, the from Violet Oakley's book, uh, her, bio, her biography, the 43 murals that she painted. I use those as illustrations for young women. She painted in a time when women weren't even allowed in the Capitol. It was all male. Mm -hmm. And she painted a time before women could even vote. She painted 25 years of her life. Yeah. And look what's left. So, and what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be? You can be whatever you want to be. Look what she became. When the whole world was against her. So I just try to encourage people, try to have them develop what's inside them. They all, we all have our talents, 
ability skills. Sometimes you just need somebody to pull that out of you and encourage you, go be the best you can be. That's what I do. That's my mentoring. That's why I like working with young people, college. So um, that kind of took it away from everything, but uh, I'll let it, you go back to the next question. Well, it was going to lead into um, a question on reform. Uh, you mentioned some of the reforms that, that we've had since 2005, mm -hmm. uh, like not staying late past 11 o'clock right. and reforming some of the house rules and conduct. Um, for you, have they gone far enough, and do you think there's still more reforms that need to be added? I think everything goes back to leadership. It still goes back to leadership. We had rules, in effect, an 11 o'clock rule when we did a pay raise. I mean, so now we have an 11 o'clock rule again. We had an 11 o'clock rule. You know what we did with the rules that we made? We suspended them. So rules are made to be suspended. So rules are suspended by leaders. So if you have good leadership, then good things happen. You can have all the rules in the world, and if you have leaders who want to figure out a way around things, you're going to get around things. So we had rules in place already, but then the leaders wanted suspension of the rules. So that's how they got to vote after 11 o'clock. You talked a little bit about media and blogging and, and uh, the technology that we've, uh, that we've seen come in. How, has that, how have you used that positively, whether through contacting constituents through email or through phone or for, uh, through different websites or, or social media? How have you used that positively in your uh, When I, when I first got elected, I um, sent out mailers, um, newsletters. For me, it was helpful because I was new at the time. You know, we talked about the first few years. I wanted to know what the district was thinking. I didn't know the district well enough. I wanted to know what they were thinking, what they wanted on the issues. So I sent out questionnaires. What do you think about this issue, tax reform? What do you think about hunting on Sunday or whatever, whatever the topic that was being dis discussed? And then I would have them send back questionnaires. But I did a district-wide news newsletter, and, and they're very expensive to send out newsletters. <clears throat> and then they became more colorful over the years and more you know, almost campaigning look, looking. They were glossy, color photos. And, mm -hmm. and one thing that technology has allowed, I, I haven't done a newsletter for hmm, probably eight years, something like that. But I um, have a website and all this stuff that anyone who wants to connect can sign up with me. But a lot of older people in the district, they just don't have access to that. So that's what the newsletter was good for. But for the sake of saving taxpayer dollars, I just didn't do it. And if people wanted to know something, they could always call me, call the district, mm -hmm. uh, or stop in. I, we have a huge traffic of people in and out. So uh, nobody asked me to send them a newsletter again. <laughs> Not like, please send us newsletters. <laughs> we all get those in the mail now, and mm -hmm. we take a look at them and usually pitch them anyhow. Uh, depending on how interesting we find them. But I never wanted to just bomb people with newsletters just for the sake of getting my name out there. I wanted to be able to get something out of it back for me or to share with them what's going on. I wanted to be informative. So I started writing two columns in the local um, weekly newspapers, uh, the Tyrone Herald and the Morses Cove Herald. And we called it The Word from Harrisburg. And I put that in like once a month. So people would still um, get a column from me in the local newspaper they could read that told them what some of the key issues, some of the things we were dealing with, or that I was working on. And that, uh, there again, I didn't have to pay for that. Taxpayers saved that, so reform. I was trying to save money back then. First um, six, eight years I was elected, I turned money back into the, back to the treasury, back to the chief clerk's office. Um, I did that probably had close to $100,000 that I turned back. And then um, we did away with the internship program. One time, the speaker would provide each member on our side, the mm -hmm. Republican caucus, with an intern, summer intern. So I started that, and um, first, first year I had uh, three interns. My first, no, two interns my first year, three interns my second year. And then I split the money between them. You know, they all liked getting a little bit of money. and. Um, then when the speaker did away with that, they did away with that program to cut internal costs. 
then I ended up pay, taking it out of my expense account. So then I paid my interns through my inner expense account. So it worked out well, and I've had an intern ever since. But I paid those out of office expenses. Then I tried to be frugal, you know, with the office expenses. I always had enough money left over to, you know, to pay interns. So, why have you chosen to to leave the house now? It's a time for me to go in a new new chapter. It's time for a new chapter in my life, uh, new direction, and it's just. Um, you know, someone asked me this this morning. I was buying apples at the local Apple Mart and uh, farm market uh, on my way here. And the woman said to me, she said, um, your time's almost ending, isn't it? Why, why, aren't, why aren't you running for re-election? And uh, you could be re-elected. You know, we, we like your service, and we think you're a great representative. It's just very nice. It was a nice compliment coming from the woman. And I don't say that you know, for a pat on the back. I'm just saying that I'm not leaving because my constituents are tired. Uh, I'm leaving maybe because I'm tired and I'm ready for a new direction. I'm ready for some a new challenge in my life. And I feel that I've taken it um, probably as far as I can go here, as far as that I can go in, in making a difference here in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. I've made a difference in 22 years. But it's now it's time for me to make a difference somewhere else. And I told this woman, I said, I used to play softball, and I played for a team that um, that won national championship, world tournaments, and we were almost professional. I mean, we played all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever I was about one step away, and I couldn't get to that ball and catch it, I was one step away from it. I was still at the height of my athletic ability, but I was about one step away is whenever I said, I've had enough softball, I'm not playing this coming year. So they went out and got someone to replace me, and the person they got to replace me ended up taking them on to a national championship. They would have never got there, I don't believe, had I still been there. They needed that additional talent, someone with new ideas, stronger, better, bigger, and because uh, I had given everything I'd given, which I've done here. And I think it's just time for new leadership. Many of these um, members that are coming back, some that will be running for leadership, are, are um, members that I mentored when I was in leadership. It's uh, something I did, new position, something new. Caucus secretary never did a mentorship program, but I mentored um, probably 46 of the House members that are here right now, mm -hmm. probably about 40 of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are our future leaders. So I've already set my mark here in the House. It's time for me to to move into another chapter. What aspect of your job as a PA house mentor did you enjoy the most? Helping people. Yeah. Um, just helping someone that didn't think that anyone would listen to them. And that, that, um, that widow, that farmer, that poor person that just had no other avenue, no other place to go. Uh, somehow we would find a way to help them. Even if there wasn't a way, within the way, sometimes we invented things and took care of the problem. So um, that was the thing that state representative allowed me to do. And if you look at my biography, uh, I quote Benjamin Franklin, uh, 1751. You know, I, I believe that my being elected a member would enable uh, my ability to do good. That's why I ran for office. I wanted to do good. And um, I just recently read in the newspaper this week. Uh, I went to a couple of functions. I uh, was invited to a borough council meeting and the mayor praised me and to a school board meeting and the president of the school board and board members thanked me. But uh, the one mayor uh, from Tyrone, Mayor Fink, said, uh, you've done a lot of good. Well, that's why I ran to begin with. So to, to, to begin by wanting to do good and help others and end with someone telling you that is kind of like like the Oreo cookie, and it's it's the beginning and the end. And uh, so I'm I'm right where I need to be and ready to move to the next chapter. Any disappointments or regrets you're leaving behind, either legislatively or or not? Um, well, there are some things always. I mean, this private-public partnership. I would like to have seen that develop more. 
but um, you know, I don't think it was meant to be. Um, maybe my idea is a little ahead of its time. Maybe that's something that will be picked up in the next General Assembly, and maybe that will be picked up in the future. But I think that that's the direction we need to go in tourism. Like I said, uh, I think outside the box sometimes, as you noticed with my proposals with the REAP and the ACRE, uh, I didn't agree with what everybody else was coming up with, but we adopted something outside what everyone else wanted to do, and it worked. I think this private-public partnership will work. We need to get state government out of the tourism business because all we do is every four years, eight years, whatever, usually it's every eight years, we just go this way for eight years, we go this way for eight years, we come back this way for eight years, and then eight years later we end up finding ourselves right here where we started. So um, I think that we need to allow tourism to expand to where they can possibly take Pennsylvania. And I, I, with all the assets we have here, the beauty, the historic designations, Philadelphia, um, this is the origin of this nation. I believe we can be the number one. I truly, honestly believe we can be the number one tourist attraction in the United States if we market the way I believe we can market. So that's, that was the whole purpose of the uh, private-public partnership. I wanted to, once again, be number one. <laughs> what have you learned by serving the people of Pennsylvania that you would take with you? Pardon me? What have you learned from the people of PA that you'll take with you into your next endeavors? I'll, I'll, what I'll take with me is that there are basically six geographic regions in PA. There's not one, there's one big state, but it's really set apart in municipalities and townships, communities. Some are bigger than others. Philadelphia, of course, is a city. Pittsburgh is a city. But there are six basic regions, and I've traveled throughout the whole state, and each area is a little bit different. Some are similar, but no two areas are the same. And we have a diverse uh, population of 12.7 million residents that are from all over the place as William Penn intended. This was a melting pot for religious freedom whenever Pennsylvania first was crafted, when it was first put together. Nothing's changed. We have all kinds of ethnicities and different types of people from all over, from every nation here in Pennsylvania. And I think that's the nice part, the neat part about Pennsylvania, that what I've taken away. I've made friends with people that I would have never had the opportunity to do, so had I not been state representative. And uh, it's crossed all kinds of um, ethnic, religious, any kind of other boundaries um, where you know, it's just a connection with other people, which I totally enjoyed. Working with young people and with young elected officials, what advice do you normally give them uh, about uh, serving in public office or looking at that as a career? Um, one of the things I tell them, they, they need a good foundation to begin with, okay, and certain, certain characteristics, certain things that you can, you can share with people, but unless they take it up, unless they actually do it, it's not going to help them. I mean, you can give them all the advice and all the leadership tips and skills. It really comes down to any intern that I've ever had, that I've ever worked with, whether it's a Temple intern or a Penn State Harrisburg intern or it's an intern back in my district. I've made every one of those interns come in and sit down with me, and we, we talk to one another for about an hour. I want to know everything about them. Why are you here? What do you expect to get out of this? I want to know the details that's driving them, that's, that's what their passion is. What are you passionate about? What do you want to be? And um, one young intern I remember came in and she was an environmental major and she was thinking about after she graduated from Penn State going back to Texas, that's where she, her family was living at the time. And um, but, her, but her passion was the environment. Well. She's currently working uh, in the Corbett administration as an environmental spokesman, and she loves her job. But you got to just take interns or individuals and line them up with what their passion is, what their skills are, and um, that's basically, I just try to point them in the right direction and let them get a taste for this. And sometimes I find interns, they don't 
I had one young man who came here that he was full of ideals. He was going to change Harrisburg and Washington and the world. And, um, and once he got here and he saw the inside uh, dealings of state government, and he got it right, right, you know, um, right side by side with me because I, I would share everything with him. I would tell him what was going on. Um, he decided to stay in the academic world, and, and uh, now he's a college professor at Purdue University, and um, he's an adjunct in uh, political communication. So he's going to have me um, lecture his freshman students. And this was a young man that um, that he was going to come down here and just be whatever in, in, in uh, state or federal government, but uh, decided now to teach instead. So now he's teaching political theory and communication at Purdue. So I'm going to be I'm going to be lecturing to Purdue students, thanks to a former intern right. at, that I had here in Harrisburg. That's phenomenal. My last question of you today is: How would you like your tenure as a state representative to be remembered? I think the legacy that we leave is not. I told this to a former senator one time, former powerful senator. He was majority leader actually um, in the Senate, visited my office and we had a discussion about what will, what will we be remembered for? And I said, I remember you for one bill. And it's only because this bill was important to me that you introduced it. But I said, nobody remembers anything you did legislatively. I didn't try to be disrespectful. I was just being honest. No one's going to remember what Jerry Stern did legislatively. Those things, fortunately, this is archived, so you're going to have to hear about some of these. I have some more legislative things, too, we didn't talk about, but, um, I, and I could go over them real briefly, but they're going to remember, they're going to remember who I was. They're going to remember my legacy as the people and the, the involvement that I was involved in them to allow them to become everything that they could be. And it's what I taught, what I taught them, and allowing them to go on to be the best that they can be. That's my legacy will be in the influence that I have with others. Teaching, sharing, you know, and helping them to maybe not just go along to get along, but to try to do the right thing. Because in the end, it, it, it does, um, you know, certain things do, um, you know, whenever you boil out all the impurities sometimes, you know, you get a better product. Gold, silver, we, we do that to boil out the impurities. But sometimes we have to go through trials in our life to make us who we are. So it's just the counseling, the encouragement, helping others to see the potential that they don't see in themselves. I never saw that in me whenever Mr. Weiss opened the door for me all those years ago. So now all I do is open doors for other people. My legacy will be the seeds that I've sown. I think that's a terrific spot and a terrific quote to end on. I uh, appreciate you sitting down and talking with us and being a part of this project. And I wish you uh, good health and a lot of luck in the rest of your endeavors. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.